My name is Stefan Seroyu, and together with my colleague Alec Wolman, we're the session co-chairs for uh, this security session. And I'm sure all of you are here to find out the kind of work that both Microsoft and Academia has been doing on these kinds of attacks that stem from speculative executions for CPUs like Meltdown and Spectre, or from the density of the cells packed in DRAM, like Rowhammer. Um, I was really hoping to have a discussion throughout the talk. Um, we're going to have three speakers, and I'm, we're going to introduce each of them. Um, I still encourage you, I, I think it's going to be difficult, and the reason for that is because I think the dynamics of this room really is not amenable to the kind of discussions I would like to have. Nevertheless, I strongly encourage you to raise your hand and ask questions if you like in the middle of the talk, and we have ample time for Q&A at the end of each, each presentation, okay? Um, okay, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the first speaker, uh, Christopher Ertel. Uh, he's a security software engineer in uh, what's called MSRC uh, at, at Microsoft. MSRC stands for Microsoft Response Center, and this is the team that uh, deals with security vulnerabilities, especially in Azure. But I'm, do, is, your, is your guys' mandate just for Azure or for the whole Microsoft? Um, no, so it's for all Microsoft products, including uh, browser, office, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, so, um, and he's going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that Microsoft's been doing uh, to mitigate uh, Meltdown Inspector. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Christopher Ertel. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Spectre Meltdown vulnerabilities and how we're able to mitigate them. All right, so Spectre and Meltdown. Um, these issues gained a huge amount of interest from the research community um, when they were disclosed in January this year. And the reason for that is because they represent a fundamentally new class of hardware security vulnerability, which allows leaking information across security boundaries um, from the browser, the hypervisor, et cetera. <clears throat> All right, so when we were first made available of these issues in June last year, we kicked off our SERP incident response process, and this is typical for whenever we're made, we are made aware of a uh, critical security vulnerability either being exploited in the wild or just a high threat uh, which requires mobilizing a large number of people within Microsoft to drive remediation of the fixes. <clears throat> so, Spectre and Meltdown, uh, once again, they apply to, uh, they have implications across nearly every security boundary and allow potentially disclosing information uh, such as passwords in the browser or guest-to-guest uh, -guest in virtualization context. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to break down the attacks themselves, um, more generally how speculative execution can lead to a side channel, and then afterwards we can go on to how we might be able to mitigate those. All right, so before we can get into speculative execution itself, uh, I'm going to need to explain a bit about how a modern CPU works. So typically when we see assembly code and we consider how a CPU executes, uh, we generally think of each instruction executing one after the other sequentially. But in reality, it's a bit more complicated than this. Uh, instructions are first decoded into a series of micro operations, which are placed into a reorder buffer. And from there, the CPU is able to make use of several optimizations. So the first of which is being superscalar. It's able to execute certain uh, micro operations in parallel concurrently. Uh, the second of which is out of order execution. And uh, this essentially allows the CPU to start executing later instructions before earlier ones to make best use of the available execution units. Um, and yeah, this is faster than just waiting for each instruction to complete before the next one can start. So speculative execution is just an extension of uh, out of order execution. Um, so the CPU is, so when the CPU has some kind of dependency on the result of an operation, uh, rather than waiting for that to be to resolve and the result to be made available, it can begin executing speculatively according to a prediction that it makes on this outcome. And the reasoning behind this is that once uh, the result is made available and uh, we can 
If the prediction was correct, uh, the results of speculative execution can be committed. So that's the calculated register values and any memory stores, for example. Um, and this is much quicker than waiting for, the res waiting for the outcome to be made available before starting execution. Conversely, if the prediction that speculation uh, ran on was incorrect, uh, the results will be discarded and the execution unrolled. All right, so the fundamental problem with speculative execution, which led to the spectre and meltdown vulnerabilities, is that not everything is thrown away when speculative execution, when incorrect speculative execution is unrolled. In particular, uh, changes to the cache state um, are not always unrolled. And that can contain private data, which an attacker might be able to later observe. All right, so now I'm going to move on to the variants themselves. Uh, so starting with variant one, this was uh, where a conditional branch would mispredict. Um, so here we have a typical bounds check uh, uh, on an untrusted index before using it as uh, an array index for this buffer. And this is a typical code pattern, very common in C and C++ code. But consider if this bounds check is mispredicted and the inner code is executed whilst untrusted index is actually greater than or equal to length. In this case, what will happen is value will be read from, um, depending on the types involved, this could be an arbitrary virtual address, considering if buff is a byte pointer and untrusted index is a 64-bit value. Uh, this could result in reading value from an arbitrary virtual address. And then after that, uh, a second array index will be performed, uh, which loads a different cache line depending on this uh, private value. So the result of this is that if an attacker can execute this code speculatively, the, um, a different cache line will be loaded as an artifact of that secret value that should not be made available. Uh, variant two was where the target of an indirect branch would be mispredicted. So, uh, Indirect branches are used when the compiler doesn't know at compile time what the target of the branch will be. So typically um, a function pointer or a vtable, for example. And if speculative execution executes one of these indirect branches on a register, it might jump to, the, to an incorrect target. And similar to before, what might happen is reading uh, a byte from an attacker-controlled register and then loading a cache line uh, according to this secret value. Um, and the cache line size is 64 bytes. So uh, in this gadget, we simply uh, shift it left six times. So variant three is specific to the kernel to user information disclosure scenario. So um, if these last three instructions are executing speculatively uh, due to conditional branch mispredict, for example, uh, what can happen is that if we try to load a, from kernel memory uh, in user land execution, uh, speculative execution will actually be able to retrieve that value and pass it on to subsequent instructions before the exception will be triggered. And so it can persist the results by loading a cache line, for example, uh, as we saw before. And uh, with this variant, user land code execution is able to read kernel memory. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a taxonomy of these kind of attacks. And so we can systematically go through the key components required and then move on to the mitigations. All right. So there are four key components required for a speculative execution side channel. Uh, the first of which is a method of gaining speculation. So as we saw, that might be conditional branch mispredict, for example. Um, and the second thing we'll need is a windowing gadget. And this is used to extend um, how long speculation can run before the CPU realizes it was speculating with an incorrect value, uh, prediction value. Um, the third thing we need is a disclosure gadget to persist the results made during speculative execution. So uh, as we saw, that might be loading a cache line according to a private value. And finally, we need a way to observe those results uh, to determine, for example, which cache line was loaded and from that infer the secret that was loaded during speculative execution. 
And if any one of these four parts are not present, the speculative execution side channel will not be able to uh, succeed. So starting with speculation techniques, um, we have the three from the uh, three variants reported. We have conditional branch mispredict. Um, and this doesn't have to be a bounds check. This can be uh, any conditional branch. So for example, a type check could lead to speculative type confusion if mispredicted. Uh, but the thing is, uh, these conditional branches can be trained based on past behavior. So we can make it very likely that speculative execution will take the conditional route, the conditional path we desire uh, during speculation. Variant two was the indirect branch misprediction. Uh, similarly, as the CPU executes, it maintains what's called the BTB, the branch target buffer, which maintains a list of uh, branch targets during, during execution. And speculative execution will use this internal buffer to predict where to jump. Um, we can also collide different, different entries. Uh, so we can have two different addresses that point to the same internal BTB entry. Um, finally, meltdown was where the CPU uh, can invoke, a, can perform, for example, a kernel load from user land and forward the result of that onto subsequent micro operations before the permission fault will be delivered. All right, so now that we're able to trigger speculation, we need a windowing gadget. And once again, this is required so that um, speculation can can execute for long enough that we are able to, dis to persist the results by reaching a disclosure gadget. So the key point here is that windowing gadgets can naturally occur in code. They can be something as simple as a dependency chain of arithmetic operations, for example, or more commonly, even just performing an uncached load. All right, so with speculation running, we can now begin to see how a side channel can be formed from this. So a side channel has three stages generally. The first is priming the system into a known initial state. The second is triggering or waiting for some victim activity to occur. Uh, and finally, uh, an attacker will need to observe whether the state changed to infer information about what happened during the victim activity. So in the context of speculative execution, the disclosure gadget will typically be um, loading a cache line according to some secret value which might have been read out of bounds, for example. Um, so for a flush and reload primitive, what an attacker will do is they will first flush an array of cache lines. Uh, the disclosure gadget will then load one of those according to a secret. And finally, uh, the disclosure primitive will time how long it takes to load each of those uh, cache lines. And whichever one's faster, uh, is likely to be loaded into the cache, and from that we can infer what the secret value was during speculative execution. All right, so just to sum up again, the four components of a speculation attack, uh, we have the speculation primitive, the windowing gadget, the disclosure gadget, and the disclosure primitive. And once again, we need all four of these to be able to leak information through a side channel. All right, so relevance to software security. Uh, variant three is specific to the kernel to user information disclosure scenario. Um, that's exception delivery. But all the others generally apply universally across the board. And so uh, we're going to need mitigations for those. All right, so now that we understand exactly what, how speculative execution can lead to a side channel attack, we can begin to go into the mitigations that we can put in place for these. <clears throat> so we have three tactics. The first is preventing speculation techniques. And specifically, what we mean by this is we want to prevent unsafe speculation, where speculative execution can lead to a disclosure gadget. The second is removing sensitive content from memory. So this is limiting what uh, speculative execution will be able to read. Uh, this can eliminate entire scenarios or simply reduce the risk from certain scenarios. And finally, removing observation channels. This is making it more difficult or even impossible for an attacker to infer uh, what changes were made to the cache state during speculative execution. But uh, once again, there's no silver bullet. 
we require a combination of different hardware and software mitigations for each of the scenarios present. So starting with preventing speculation techniques, and once again, the goal here is to prevent a speculation primitive from leading to a disclosure gadget. First thing we can do is use some kind of serialization of the instruction pipeline. So on x86, we have the LFENCE instruction, which has the neat property of acting as a speculation barrier. So if we go back to variant one, we see um, uh, this bounds check on an untrusted index. What we can do is insert an L fence as a speculation barrier here after the check. And what this will guarantee is that uh, these subsequent two array indexes will not be executed until uh, speculation has resolved to this point. So uh, this code will never execute speculatively with untrusted index out of bounds. Second thing we can do is have some kind of implicit serialization. So this is forcing safe behavior down an architecturally incorrect path. So going back to variant one, what we can do is uh, considering if this code executes, the inner code executes even when untrusted index is out of bounds, we can uh, use conditional move instruction to set untrusted index to this zeroed register if it is uh, greater than or equal to length. And what this will do is it will make the behavior of speculative execution uh, safe because it will simply load zero from this buffer, which is going to be in bounds. Uh, for doing this, we have the QSpecter command line flag in Visual C++, and this will automatically identify potentially vulnerable patterns and insert appropriate serialization. Uh, similarly, in Microsoft Edge, we have uh, mitigations in the Chakra JavaScript engine, which inserts serialization to prevent an attacker from being able to construct these patterns. The second thing we can do is have some kind of workload isolation. So uh, we talked about the branch target buffer. Um, typically, this prediction, these kind of prediction states are uh, either per core or per simultaneous multi-thread. Uh, in the case of uh, simultaneous multi-threading, such as Intel hyper-threading. So what we can do is, in Hyper-V, we can use CPU groups and min roots to assign a certain core to a particular uh, guest, and then the others for the host. And what this will, what this will do is, it, uh, since the branch prediction state will never be shared, is not shared between the host and the guest, uh, a, guest will, a malicious guest will have no way of colliding the branch prediction state. Um, so the next thing is the, uh, with the recent microcode updates provided by Intel and AMD, we have uh, some new model-specific registers which can control uh, indirect branches. So we have IBRS, first of all, which essentially acts as a way of allowing of creating uh, two different privilege uh, privileges. So you can set IBRS to zero for the less privileged state. And then on kernel entry, for example, uh, you can set it to one. And this will create the guarantee that the more privileged state will not be able to be influenced by predictions made in the less privileged state. The next thing we have is IBPB, which essentially allows us to flush, to flush the prediction state. And this can be used when switching between different uh, hypervisor contexts, for example, to prevent different contexts from poisoning each other's uh, prediction state. Finally, we have STIBP, which, once again, a certain prediction state will be shared among two sibling hyperthreads on a single core. Uh, when we set STIBP to one, it just offers the guarantee that uh, sibling hyperthreads won't be able to poison each other's branch prediction state. All supported versions of Windows Client make use of these by default. <coughs> the next thing we can do is use the final thing to prevent speculation techniques we can do is use safely speculated or non-speculated indirect branches. So on Intel CPUs, uh, the far jump and far ret instructions which are indirect jumps which change the segment, will not be predicted. And so we can replace indirect branches with these, and that will, that will prevent uh, variant two. 
Uh, similarly for AMD, we can use this L-Fence serialization instruction, which will guarantee that the behavior is safe uh, during speculation. And finally, we have this proposal from Google for Repoline, and this allows us, this acts as a way of allowing um, catching speculative, speculative execution in an infinite loop, while the architectural route will perform the indirect jump as usual. Uh, for the hypervisor and Windows kernel, we're exploring a combination of these to make best use of performance. For removing sensitive content from memory, uh, the goal is once again to limit entire attack scenarios or just limit the risk as best possible. So the first thing we can do is have hypervisor address space segregation. So uh, what this means is that the hypervisor will only ever map guest physical memory on demand as it's needed and as opposed to historically where all, phys all guest memory was always uh, mapped. And what this means is that if a guest, if a guest VM performs a hypercall into the hypervisor, only its own guest memory will be mapped. It, uh, speculation in the hypervisor will not be able to read any memory of other guests. The next thing we have is KVA shadow. So this applies specifically to variant three. Um, Previously, the, in user mode execution, we had the kernel page table entries mapped, but just marked as inaccessible. Uh, what we do with KVA shadow is when transitioning uh, between them, we ensure that the user mode execution never has the kernel page table entries mapped. And what this means is that speculative execution in user mode will not be able to read kernel memory um, because it's not physically present. Um, all supported versions of Windows Client make use of this. And the final tactic we have is removing observation channels. So once again, the goal here is to make it difficult or impossible for an attacker to observe uh, changes made during speculative execution. First thing we can do is we can map guest physical memory as uncacheable in the hypervisor. So here we have some system physical memory uh, in the guest, it's still ma marked as, marked as write-back cache, and so there'll be no performance impact for the guest itself. But in the hypervisor, we map it as uncacheable. And what this means is that if speculative execution in the hypervisor attempts to perform a load, um, since it's marked as uncacheable memory, it will never bring that into the cache. And this acts as, uh, as a generic mitigation for host to guest flush and reload, which requires shared cache lines. Next thing we can do is we can ensure that we never share any physical memory between guests. So similarly, uh, uh, we, we want to prevent flush and reload between guests. So we just ensure that uh, each guest has its own copy of everything in physical memory. And so they can never uh, influence each other's cache state. Final thing we can do is we can decrease browser time of precision. So there was this API performance.now accessible from JavaScript, which could be used to time a single load and determine whether that, that memory that it was loading was in the cache or not. Um, what we do is we decrease the pre precision of this and add random jitter to prevent clock edging techniques. And so it is now impossible for an attacker to infer whether or not a single load is in the cache or not. All right, so closing remarks, I just want to uh, sum up once again that there's no silver bullet. For each of the scenarios present, we're going to require a different combination of mitigations. <coughs> uh, once again, going over the variants, uh, they're all hardware vulnerabilities. Uh, variant one is going to require software changes, so that might be adding uh, appropriate serialization by the compiler. Variant two is mitigated by the OS, making use of the indirect branch controls, as we saw. And finally, variant three, this was the kernel to user information disclosure meltdown. And that is completely mitigated now with KVA shadow. All right, so since then, we've been made aware of some new variants. We have speculative store bypass, which made use of uh, mispredicting uh, data dependencies between load and store instructions. Uh, this can be mitigated by identifying vulnerable code patterns and inserting instruction serialization once again. Uh, it can also be 
can also be mitigated by disabling this memory disambiguation optimization by the CPU. But this is not done by default because there are currently no known exploitable patterns in Windows code. Second thing, second variant is lazy floating point state restore. So this was an optimization made by the operating system uh, when context switching between processes, uh, the floating point registers would not be copied. They would simply be marked as inaccessible. And then the first time they were made, made use of, this would trigger an exception where the kernel would restore them. Uh, to mitigate this, we just disable this optimization and the floating point registers are always copied. Um, then we have bounds check bypass store. This was uh, similar to variant one. If we have a conditional branch mispredicting leading to an out of bounds store, if that store corrupts an indirect branch target, that can leave an attacker with arbitrary speculation at an arbitrary address. Uh, the way we mitigate that is just by adding speculation barriers again, similar to variant one. And finally, we have NetSpectre, which is the first kind of speculative execution side channel not using the cache. Uh, that was timing the AVX instructions. The mitigation for that is once again just using a speculation barrier in vulnerable patterns. We, we expect for speculative execution side channel vulnerabilities to be continuing source of research. And so we have our speculative execution side channel bounty. Uh, max payout is 250K for new variants. Um, we also have uh, on TechNet some blogs with more technical analysis of any of the variants, as well as developer guidance. All right, so thanks for listening. And uh, thank you to everyone who's worked on this. It's been a tremendous uh, undertaking. <laughs> thank you. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question. If, oh, Chris, sorry, right there. OK, yeah, yeah, Chris. How expensive are the various mitigations? Sorry? How expensive are the various mitigations? Um, so that depends on uh, the operating system itself and your, how recent your CPU is. So from our analysis, uh, the latest Windows 10 with a modern processor from uh, within two years is less than 10%. Um, for older operating systems such as Windows 7, where uh, there are some differences, for example, um, the, kernel, the kernel does all the um, uh, font parsing, there is more kernel to user transition. That's slightly more expensive. But uh, yeah, for the latest Windows 10 with a modern processor, the performance impact is uh, not that noticeable. It's single digit. Uh, there's, more there's more analysis on our website uh, if you want more details. So you, you told us about this complex grid of mitigations where it, it, it seems like it's hard to tell if the, you're done filling out that grid and, and coming up with all the, the relevant advice to avoid security problems. And I, I wonder how much of this you think is coming about because the hardware is, is closed to us and we, we can't even in principle do an end-to-end -end foundational analysis of security. And could this be some motivation for adopting more open source hardware? Uh, good question. Uh, so we have been working with Intel. We have a non-disclosure agreement with them. Um, so we have some information, but yeah, absolutely. Some details are not known to us. Um, that's why we rely on our bounty part partly uh, for more information to be made available to us and we'll react as best we can. Um, thank you for your question. Sure. I also, also have questions along the lines like, you know, sort of similar, my question was a variant of your question, um, right? I mean, I think it's not, not unlikely that within the next year or so there's going to be yet another speculative execution, way of doing spe speculative execution to exploit kernels, right? So, okay. 
And it looks like the process we have in place right now is, is you know, hopefully they're not gonna, gonna release it to the public, whoever discovered this, this, and hopefully it gives time to the Microsofts and Googles of the world to go patch their kernels, or the, and the Apples of the world to go patch their kernels. Um, it seems pretty sad to me. <laughs> I don't know, it seems like a sad state of affairs. So it, it, do you have, is there any investment into having a more, you know, principled solution to these things? Like you were mentioning, uh, you know, sort of disclosing open source, open sourcing hardware. It's, on some way, it's very nice. On the other hand, like Intel can, is probably not gonna do that anytime soon. Um, so it just sort of, it feels to me that we're kind of stuck uh, with a bad situation on our hands. Uh, so the mitigations we have in place are designed to not only mitigate existing uh, vectors, but also to proactively consider reducing the attack surface as much as possible. Um, so uh, as we saw with the indirect branch controls, we can flush the prediction state uh, regularly, um, as well as uh, others. Um, but yeah, we have our own internal research. It's ongoing and we'll continue to mitigate it as best possible. Uh, thanks. So I, I had another question. Um, so it seems like a bunch of the mitigations that you mentioned uh, require, for instance, uh, modifying binaries so that certain uh, instruction sequences have the appropriate uh, protections yep. in them. Um, but presumably there are situations where where customers who who are potentially even attackers are allowed to uh, load their own code that they've compiled or written in assembly. And so in terms of mitigations, has there been any uh, any thought into what can be done to address those kinds of situations? Uh, yeah, very good question. So um, you mentioned situations where an attacker is able to supply their own code. Uh, so for example, one of those scenarios is in the browser where, they're, where we're running arbitrary JavaScript from an attacker. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Chakra, the JavaScript engine of Edge, has its own heuristics to detect patterns such as variant one and its uh, appropriate serialization. Um, more generally than that, though, uh, you mentioned that uh, within Microsoft, we have a lot of code, and rebuilding the whole world isn't always possible. Uh, that's why we have a combination of mitigations just aiming to mitigate the problem as best as possible. Um, uh, yeah, also for hypervisor scenario, we have mitigations from guest to guest, as I talked about. So uh, really, it's just limiting the severity of the attacks and uh, yeah, doing as much as we can. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. Well, I, I guess I'm looking for a slightly higher level uh, answer in the following sense. Does the current state of affairs keep you up at night? Um, <laughs> So or I think are you relatively happy with the mitigations? I think at the moment, the mitigations are pretty strong. Uh, once again, we have our bounty. So if real world attacks are submitted to us, uh, they might be eligible for a bounty and we'll try to uh, mitigate them as best as possible. But once again, it's a continuing ongoing matter of research. And so uh, at the moment, I think we're well protected, but uh, we're ready to react if more information becomes available to us. Are there any no public instances of meltdown or specter attacks that have been sort of, rather than proof of concepts, you know, mm -hmm. researchers showing, look, we can do this? Um, uh, to my knowledge, uh, we um, haven't. And, and my question is not just about Microsoft, it's just in general, like if you happen to know. Um, yeah, to my knowledge, I don't think these attacks are being actively used in the wild right now. Um, but what we see from our detections is only a small sample, so uh, I think it's possible in the future they might be used by attackers uh, in, in real world scenarios, but I uh, can't comment further right now. Any other questions? Uh, 
Okay, let's, uh, let's thank the speaker then. Thank you. Okay, um, our next speaker is Professor Margaret Martinosi from Princeton University. And her research interests are computer architecture and mobile computing with a particular focus on power efficient systems. Uh, her current research is focusing on the hardware software, on hardware software interface approaches to managing heterogeneous parallelism and power performance trade-offs in systems, ranging all the way from smartphones all the way up to large scale data centers. Uh, Professor Martinosi is a fellow of IEEE and ACM, and she's won numerous awards. I'll just mention two. Uh, she won, in 2015, she won the ISCA Long-Term Influential Paper Award, and in 2017, the ACM Sigmobile Test of Time Award. And take it away, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, this follows nicely from the wonderful previous talk, because the previous talk sort of gave us a state of play. And what I'm gonna try to give here is some thoughts that relate a bit to your question about our attempt at a principled way forward. Um, so this story, parts of the story do start in January with Spectre and Meltdown, but a lot of the story starts much earlier. Um, and I'm gonna take you through the flow from our earlier work, verifying memory consistency models, to our current work, synthesizing security exploits automatically. So we started in about five years ago with a simple goal. Memory consistency models have to do with enforcing the ordering of memory events uh, in hardware software systems uh, in a well-specified way. And we had the goal of saying for a particular part of the memory consistency model, namely from the specification given by the ISA to a particular implementation in hardware, is that correct? Does that pipeline correctly implement, say, Intel's total store order memory model or ARM's weaker memory model and so forth. Um, we did that based on an axiomatic approach that I'll go through in a little bit of detail. Um, after that, we recognized that actually that localized view at just the microarchitecture compared to the ISA was insufficient in many cases because there are so many other parts of the memory consistency model landscape. In particular, high-level languages have a memory model. C specifies a memory model with uh, atomics and sequential consistency and so forth. The compiler and the OS play a role as well because the compiler maps from those C constructs down to assembly language and the OS manages virtual to physical address translations that also have a role to play in memory consistency models. And then lastly, the, the microarchitecture is sort of specified as a pipeline is only a piece of the puzzle because there's a full coherent memory hierarchy to worry about. And there's also the fact that eventually this gets mapped down to Verilog or something like that, and we need to make sure that that too um, represents a correct implementation. Uh, so over the course of the past five years, we've developed a suite of tools that address this with this general philosophy being unified across all of them. The basic approach that we use across all of them is to have an axiomatic specification that's given alongside the implementation um, and that can be automatically translated into a set of, of happens before graphs. Now happens before graphs have been used uh, by higher level compiler and software people for a while um, where the nodes in them are typically instructions or coarser or granularity. We are taking those happens before graphs down to the microarchitecture and the implementation level where they map more to hardware features. Um, the key thing that we're doing is we're saying if there's an axiom that says that A must happen before B, then we can draw an edge for it. If there's another axiom that says that B must happen before C, we can draw an edge for it. If there's an axiom that says that C must happen before A, we can draw an edge for it. And in fact, we can enumerate this effectively across all possible orderings for the software running on a given hardware implementation. And so that's why I show sort of multiple layers of these happens before graphs. The key thing is that if A happens before B, B happens before C, and C happens before A, then that's a cycle it's saying that A is happening before itself, physically impossible. And so every time we can show that a particular happens before graph is cyclic, we can show that that is a physically unobservable event. It will not happen. And so if there's something that we're verifying that should be forbidden, it should never happen, we need to ensure that every possible interleaving, every possible happens before graph is cyclic. And so that's, that's the secret sauce of all of these tools up and down. 
The key thing that's relevant here is to recognize that the same sorts of event ordering through memory issues that make a memory consistency model correct or incorrect also play intricately in the space of these kinds of uh, side channel attacks that we just heard about. Because the, the ordering in which you access memory is a key part of it. And so over the past two years, we did this uh, sort of transition from memory consistency models into the security space. Uh, so first I want to tell you a little bit about these axiomatic models. Here's a sort of a simple view of a dual core processor. Five stage pipelines, fetch, decode, execute, kind of like your architecture class from undergrad, um, along with some sort of coherence protocol, single writer, multiple reader, and so forth. We can take that and we can ask the designer or we can help automate the process of expressing that as a set of axioms. And I've shown a very, very simple case here and just two of the axioms. So in this case, the top half of this box is an axiom written in our domain-specific language called MuSpec that basically says instructions are fetched in order, okay? The second half is, for this very simple processor, a very simple axiom that says if instructions are fetched in order, they will also be executed in order. That's all. So this is very simple, but we have actually built up axiomatic specifications for processors as complex as Intel Sandy Bridge. Um, including the virtual to physical um, uh, address translation issues in which we have parts of the specification that correspond to hardware and other parts of the specification that correspond to axioms that are actually enforced by orderings done by the operating system. And these axioms can be composed so that the OS's uh, axioms can be written by an OS specialist and the hardware axioms can be written by an, a hardware specialist and we can put the two together. Uh, so as I said, we have a process of effectively exhaustively, um, but we're using SMT solvers, so we aren't sort of stupidly exhaustively enumerating all possible interleavings. Uh, so what you can see there are a whole bunch of happens before graphs starting to be enumerated. Each of the nodes in one of those columns corresponds to one stage in a pipeline. This is for a sort of microarchitecture level consideration. So as you go down, one of those columns, that's an instruction going through fetch, decode, execute, and perhaps some memory hierarchy stages as well. The different columns in each one of those uh, boxes, the different columns here, correspond to different instructions. And every arrow that's drawn is drawn based on some axiom that we learned from the specification. Nothing is assumed, so we don't assume program order or anything like that. We check everything about the, the microarchitecture. And so we come up with this family of microarchitectural habits before graphs. And then we use SMT solver techniques to make it efficient to check for cyclic or acyclicity for each one of these many happens before graphs. As long as we find a cycle and something was supposed to be forbidden, we are good. If there was something that was supposed to be forbidden and we find an acyclic case, we can give that to the designer and we can say, here's your problem. And we have had cases where we give that uh, to a designer or we look at it ourselves and we can figure out where the erroneous um, design aspect was that caused us to be missing an edge that would have ordered things appropriately. We've also found cases where we were missing an axiom and had to add an axiom. So we can go either way and the tools are fast enough to be interactive. For these kinds of specifications, the runs are seconds, minutes, occasionally hours, not too often hours. So um, we started, as I said, from that sort of ISA to microarchitecture view um, but clearly real systems span from high level languages through OS and compilers and down to microarchitecture and below. And so we wanted a more comprehensive view. And a more recent tool that we started about three years ago called TriCheck uh, has this sort of three layer view. Um, so we start from high level language litmus tests written in C, in, the, in our case, it could be another language. And we take them through some sort of evaluator that says what is supposed to be per permitted or forbidden about that litmus test from the high level language memory model's point of view. So we get that permitted or forbidden output up top. We also take them through compiler mappings that take from C down to an instruction level uh, view of things and then across through our axiomatic models to a microarchitecture, a hardware aware view of what is observable or unobservable. And we put those two together. And you can see the sort of matrix that results from this. 
if the software says that something is supposed to be permitted and our model says it's observable, we're okay. If the software says that something is supposed to be forbidden and our model says I have enumerated everything and every single case is cyclic, it will never be observable, also okay, and those are the two green boxes. If the software model says something is supposed to be permitted and we say it will never be observed, uh, that is overly strict, but not a bug. So that's a case where you might be leaving some performance on the table, but it's okay. If the software says that something is supposed to be forbidden and we find a case where it's observable, we find an acyclic uh, happens before graph, that is a bug. And so to test out the utility of this kind of a framework, we tried it out on a new emerging instruction set architecture called RISC-V. Oh, I should also say, as I said, this is fast enough. These are sort of minutes of execution. This is fast enough that you can iteratively run through design processes. You can decide um, when you find a bug what you want to change. Do you want to change the ISA itself, the compiler, or the microarchitecture? And we actually have found bugs basically up and down the stack. We have found bugs in compilers. We have found bugs in microarchitectures. And as I will talk about now, we have found bugs in an instruction set architecture, namely RISC-V. So for the RISC-V case study, we started a couple years ago when RISC-V's instruction set architecture, this is a now sort of widely known open source instruction set architecture. At the time, it was in a draft specification mode, but it was still being widely used and, and talked about. Um, we took 1,700 different C11 programs um, as our high-level language litmus tests, and we developed axioms for seven distinct RISC-V implementations. So each of these would be a legal processor within the RISC-V spec, but different amounts of out-of-orderness. So you can imagine one being a simple in-order single-issue processor with no speculation, all the way up to fancy out-of-order pipelines with lots of, of uh, reordering and speculation. They all abided by the specs, though, but they varied in reordering. Uh, what we found was that when we, when we went through this process, uh, hundreds of times we were ending up in the red square, the buggy outcome square. Um, and it was true both for the base specification of the ISA as well as for one that had additional support for atomics that was supposed to actually help with exactly these kinds of problems, you know, it, providing appropriate fences and so forth. The problem was that it actually didn't provide appropriate fences. So in the previous talk, for example, Christopher talked about inserting L fences at key points to order parts of the code. Uh, RISC-V did not have a sufficiently what's called cumulative type of fence of that sort to bring back ordering when it was needed, and in fact, it could not legally compile many C programs as a result of that. Because there are C constructs in the C11 memory model that say that a programmer is supposed to be able to ask for sequential consistency. And if you don't have the right kind of fence to actually implement that ordering, you can never compile that program correctly. Uh, so that's one of sort of several issues that were found um, that led to these kinds of buggy outcome results. Um, we worked to get RISC-V's attention, and eventually after our paper was published, we did get their attention. And um, a memory model working group was formed about a year ago to address these issues. And it's really a nice sort of win-win situation um, in the sense that the memory model working group was able to work through the, the issues and create a memory model that's not just uh, sort of more correct than before, but is also formally specified and a lot cleaner than before. Um, and just last week, the memory model working group and the RISC-V consortium members voted to ratify this new improved RISC-V memory model. Uh, we're going through the sort of final sort of uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's of making that real, that ratification sort of real. So that's great. Um, what about Spectre and Meltdown? So as I said, about a year ago, we were making this mental transition from the sorts of memory ordering issues that you worry about for memory consistency models to the sorts of memory, model, uh, memory ordering issues that you worry about for security. And so here's my one slide simplistic version of what you just heard a half an hour about. Uh, Spectre and Meltdown are essentially take a well-known cache side channel attack, in this case flush and reload, mix it with a widely used hardware feature, speculation, and, and what was surprising was not either of those on their own, 
um, but sort of the facility at which new exploits could be created. And so clearly there was an awful lot of news uh, that broke. We had actually already been working for about six months at that point on a tool uh, that would build off of TriCheck and address some of these issues. And so in January, we sort of set to work to sort of recreate Spectre and Meltdown and see what else we could find along the way. The basic sort of principled approach that we wanted was to step away from the idea of security being kind of close the door after the horse is out of the barn to uh, a more principled forward-looking approach where we could give designers tools that would help them reason about their systems in advance and more automatically. So you don't have to stare so much at individual designs, but instead you can have more automated analysis. And our goal was the following. We wanted to be able to give someone a, 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 give a system, a, a good specification of a system to study, and a specification of a class of attack patterns. And then from that say, go analyze, synthesize, tell me what you find. Can you find that attack pattern exploitable in that specified system. That was the idea. Either output synthesized attacks or determine that none are possible. Now you could say that uh, this is a malware generator. Uh, it kind of is, uh, but the goal is to have this be in the hands of designers rather than in the hands of people who want malware. Um, so what we did is we did that. We developed a tool called Checkmate to do this based on the micro, uh, micro architectural happens before graphs that I already talked about. And the too long didn't read version of this is that we, the tool automatically synthesized Spectre and Meltdown, as well as two new distinct exploits and many variants. And the top link here is our archive paper from January where we talked just about the two new variants. And then the bottom link is uh, the draft hot off the presses of a paper that will uh, get published in uh, October about the, um, the actual tool by which we did this and the text and techniques by which we did this that I'm gonna talk about next. So in more detail, the idea is to frame these classes of attacks as patterns of event interleavings, but hey, that's what memory consistency models are already doing. That's what our happens before graphs are already doing. So essentially we're saying here is a fragment of a happens before graph do you find it anywhere in an execution? And second of all, we want the executions to be hardware specific. We want to know if the attack is realizable on a given hardware implementation. So we need a way of specifying hardware, and we do that with the MuSpec axioms the same as before. So as before, we have the ability to take a microarchitecture, um, take a microarchitecture and turn it into axioms, and we have this ability unlike before, to give it a pattern. So instead of saying, take the axioms and tell me if you find a cycle, it's take the axioms and tell me if you find this pattern in an acyclic execution. So it's a little bit beyond, it's actually a lot beyond where we were before because it's a cycle check with a pattern finding in, uh, action as well. So for example, um, one of the things that I don't, didn't have time to talk about in the memory consistency model space is we have a notion of how to manage uh, cache lifetime. So whether, uh, when a value comes from the cache line and where it was sourced from. And we call those uh, values in cache lifetimes or VICLs. Uh, and so we can come up with constructs that uh, allow us to reason about the possible sources of a value. Did it come from the store buffer or did it come from the cache? And if so, was it an eviction out of the cache in between and so forth? So we have Vickle creates that correspond to something new in the cache, and Vickle expires that correspond to something being evicted out of the cache. So you take your microarchitectural axioms, you, you take a pattern that you're looking for, and you take some constraints on the number of cores, the number of threads, the number of instructions to keep things tractable, and you send that into our tool Checkmate. Again, it enumerates. Um, possible execution graphs that A are acyclic and that B show this pattern. And now I think you can see that this is a case where automation is a, a huge sort of brain helper. You would hate to have to sort of stare at complicated graphs and look for that pattern in them. You want some help with this. So the specification is essentially the same as before. Um, speculation is something that MuSpec is uh, already supported Basically, we can allow for 
items to be brought into the cache in a way that isn't necessarily ordered with instruction execution, right? And we can allow for items to be brought into the cache in a way that isn't particularly ordered with branch instructions. So those are the kinds of things that actually were raised in the previous talk. In addition, um, because we have this full stack analysis, we can handle software, user level software, operating system and hardware events and locations, user level software, operating system and hardware ordering details. Hardware optimizations like speculation fit in well. Um, because we've handled operating systems in the past in a tool called CodeCheck, we can handle processes and resource sharing and memory hierarchies and cache coherence protocols. I don't want to oversell this. We are not going down to Verilog in this tool, although we do in other tools. Um, but we do think that uh, once you're operating in this axiomatic landscape, this is a huge help in automating the analysis. Uh, so the last piece of this puzzle is how do we do these sort of pattern enumerations, and that's with relational model finding. So in the first half of the talk, we did the cycle analysis using SMT techniques. This is relational model finding because we need to find a pattern, not just a cycle. And so RMF essentially tries to find these satisfying instances or subparts within a larger graph. Uh, in this case, we're doing this um, by taking the new spec, translating it into alloy, which is a domain-specific language that's intended to uh, fit into a relational model finding approach. The RMF problems get mapped onto a model finder called CodCod, which in turn uses off-the-shelf SAT solvers. Uh, so in this way, uh, we can feed together and automate the process. And so um, here is what Spectre looks like in our world. Uh, so as before, these columns of nodes correspond to instructions being executed. You can see by the label on the top um, it, the, the different uh, threads that are involved. Uh, you can see, for example, that Spectre was based on a flush and reload threat pattern. So in the upper right, that's the pattern that the relational model finding technique is looking for. Um, you can see that you would not want to analyze that graph to look for that pattern in there, but it's in there. Follow the red arrows and you can find it. And the last thing that it does is it generates the skeleton or the litmus test, the security litmus test, that would um, correspond to a version of Spectre. Um, this is a template for code. You still have to sort of make it concrete with particular addresses and so forth. But the step from here to a real piece of Spectre code is um, a pretty um, straightforward piece of programming work for someone who's familiar with the instruction set that they're operating in. OK, so that's Spectre. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to, was to say Spectre was based on one class of exploits called a flush and reload threat pattern. We wanted to see what about other threat patterns, prime and probe being one that has been talked about a lot in the literature. And so we said, what if we put in this different pattern, the prime and probe pattern, in uh, what happens then? And in fact, what happened then was that we found two distinct variants of the exploit, um, in this case using invalidation patterns between two cores rather than flush and reload patterns on a single core to create a new case of um, uh, almost identical to Spectre, but with invalidations being the way that things were evicted out of the cache rather than um, flushes on a single core. And again, uh, the tool generates the security litmus test automatically. We call them security litmus tests rather than uh, malware uh, <laughs> because the idea is that just as in memory consistency models, we have built up as a community a suite of tests over time that designers use to stress test their systems. We view the ability to generate security litmus tests as an important construct for designers to help them design against these sorts of threats and to explore new classes of threats. So one of the things that we want to do in subsequent work is to automatically generate the threat patterns that might be most interesting. And that's actually where we are right now. OK, so uh, second to last slide. Uh, this is the money shot in some ways. So the top part of this table are the flush and reload patterns. The bottom part of this table are prime and probe. Uh, it's the exploit pattern. The number of instructions that we placed as a bound in the relational model finding, because that does affect the execution time of all these tools. Um, but what you can see is that with relatively small instruction counts, you can generate um, 
pretty real exploits, such as Spectre Meltdown and the, the new variants. Um, the minutes to synthesize the first exploit, that is, this thing is relational model finding and finding exploit, uh, you know, the, the first one, is sort of five minutes to a couple hours. And it continues to run until it has found all the possible exploits, all the possible ways that that pattern can be found and all the possible graphs that could be enumerated. And that's sort of um, seven minutes to uh, three or four hours. Uh, the number of uh, exploits that were synthesized correspond to all the different balletic ways that you can create something that's specter-like or specter prime like And you can see that those numbers get quite high. And so one of the values that we see in this work is the ability to give someone the reassurance that they found not just a way that someone could exploit their code, but hopefully a whole bunch of ways that someone uh, could exploit their hardware. So, uh, in terms of takeaways, um, yes, we found two, two new variants, Spectre Prime and Meltdown Prime, that use cache invalidations rather than um, uh, C flush. Uh, but more importantly to us is this key overall philosophy that the event ordering issues of security exploit patterns align strongly with the memory consistency model analysis that uh, we've already been doing. Uh, it's a very principled step from ad hoc one-off analysis of different exploits to formal automated synthesis. And the goal has always been to span software, operating system, and hardware for a holistic but hardware-aware analysis. And those are the two papers that I'm inviting you to read. And if you remember nothing else, please wake up and look at the two names in red, because everyone in the room should want to hire these two wonderful students. Caroline Triple sat down after our last TriCheck paper and said, I want to work on security. And within six months, she was doing this. Um, she is an amazing PhD student who will be on the market uh, this year. Yatin Menerkar also did a lot of the work that I talked about today, including finding um, through our tool set errors in two formally proven correct, proven correct compiler mapping proofs and errors in compilers that go with it and some other universal memory consistency model analysis beyond witness tests that I didn't have time to talk about. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer some questions. Thanks. That was a really interesting talk, thank you. Um, so, so one question I do have is, uh, you talk about having these specific microarchitectural happens before graphs, and once you've got one of those, you can go search for it and synthesize a whole bunch of examples. Um, and there's sort of some natural follow-up question, which is, you know, if you look at something like the NetSpectre attack, um, that discussed a uh, side channel based on the power state of the AVX2 units. Um, or if you look at uh, variant fours, those are about memory dependent speculation. So there's this natural sort of question of, can you take what you've got here and, you know, and actually go and find these new classes? Or is it something where you do need to know all these UHBs up front and then once you've got them, you can go find them? Uh, so we have, um, as I said, we have uh, found bugs that span OS to hardware. We have found b bugs that, uh, that span between cores. So one thing I want to stress is the, we aren't doing this per graph, we are doing this for a set of axioms. So as long as one can write the axioms, we can enumerate the graphs. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that things like memory dependence, they're already within our model, so yes. Uh, NetSpecter, I am pretty sure we could write axioms to handle sort of how the packet processing feeds through the rest of the system. Uh, no, no, so, so, so to clarify my question, I, I mean, um, you, you synthesize prime and probe, or you, you synthesize the Spectre Prime, Meltdown Prime, things like this, right? Um, and there's, like, essentially, either this tool should have spat out that you could have memory dependence based speculation bugs, or it didn't. And, like, either way is interesting. So. Uh, so, for example, as far as I know, NetSpectre is still flush and reload. It's just a different uh, style of flush and reload they, they talk a, about a, that, mm. that causes the invocation to happen differently. I'm not. We can take I, this offline. I, let me finish. Okay. Uh, so, if it's within flush and reload, then with the right axioms, we can synthesize <gasps> it. I agree, and I said at the end that we do want to be able to enumerate um, new classes of exploits, and that's what we're working on now.
stuff on. Um, so, so based on your experience with Checkmate, do you have any advice for hardware designers for how to design their CPU so that Checkmate won't find any exploits? Um, when we started this work five years ago, people, I think, were very reluctant at the idea of having to have axiomatic specifications alongside their design. Um, and I'm hoping that over the set of observations that we've made over these five years, we're increasingly um, finding designers more open to having that be a key part of the design process. So one analogy I make is 20 years ago, architects didn't think about power. They were encouraged not to think about power. That was for later in the design chain. Today, I'm sad to say that I would say verification is still, if, you, if I say the word verification, people think about something that's very late in the hardware design process. And one of our goals is to make tools that are amenable to being used earlier in the design process so that hardware designers will be more open to using them because they'll be at interactive speed. So we think that the axiomatic approach, while not natural to today's architects, is helpful enough that uh, people should be coming around to it. Um, and I, you know, we can talk about whether to do sort of a correct by construction flow where the axioms sort of follow uh, sort of automatically from synthesis tools or whether the axioms are written alongside a, a traditional design. I'm okay with either one. The main thing is I, I think we need these interface specifications that let us say, at this point, here are some rules you should be able to count on. And I think that's key. Um, if we start to have these interface specifications with corresponding axioms, uh, then we can automate different analysis techniques, some of which would be sort of synthesis driven or correct by construction, and some of which would be ancillary but still sort of formal documentation. One of the key things is most memory consistency models, for example, are still written in English. But increasingly, people are coming around to the idea that they should be written in a way that can be sort of automatically analyzed and verified. And so increasingly, so for example, RISC-V went from a, a not very correct and written in English spec to now being something that is formally specified. There's a, there are formal models for it. And I think that's a good sign. Okay, uh, let's go back to five years ago where mm -hmm. we don't know how to exploit speculative execution. Do you think your methodology can identify any kind of exploit variants that we know right now? Uh, so, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a chicken and egg aspect of this, of modeling enough to be able to find the things. Um, we were finding bugs before Spectre and Meltdown broke, and we found different bugs after the news broke. Um, we hadn't been using speculation in all of our models before January, and so we added it in um, afterwards. There could be something that we are choosing to abstract away now that we should include in a model going forward. Um, but the basics of Spectre and Meltdown have been known for a while. Like speculation and flush and reload are both concepts that have been known for more than five years. So in that sense, people should have known, um, but I think people were unaware of the facility with which they could be exploited. It, it seems that there is some area that we, can, we couldn't identify the problem by using your methodology. It looks very formal and very nice. Do you have any idea that what you can provide through this method in general, and what are the things that you couldn't provide? So at the end of the day, we're going to see another type of side channel, probably completely different variant from the speculative execution. But we couldn't tell whether there are actually such a things that exist by using your methodology, right? So as I've said, we are looking at ways to automatically generate the new attack pattern classes so that we can, for example, you can imagine genetic algorithms or something that, that creates um, new uh, graph snippets and then says, is this an attack class or not? Um, so uh, it's an ongoing thing, but 
the ability to automatically anal analyze once you have an attack class seems like an important step forward. My question, great talk. I really enjoyed your talk. My question is a variant of, I don't know if I'm asking the same question or not, actually. And, but so you mentioned sort of the two side channel attacks you mentioned is, is, are based on uh, memory caches, right? So the prime and probe and the prime uh, flash, flash and reload. Flash and reload. There are a lot of caches in the architecture, sure. not just that. Mm -hmm. And the question is how much work how minimal is your technique to actually sort of, un, you know, reapply these so these, these things to other to other caches in in the I CPU or elsewhere? Actually, I get the feeling. I mean, we would. I think everyone in the room would like it if if um, there was sort of one big answer. Uh, there clearly isn't. Uh, it's it's steps on the way. Uh, I, I feel that we have all been. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been lied to about what architectural state is. Let's be honest, right? So when I teach an undergrad architecture class, we talk about architectural state being what the software can see. Um, but that is an extremely nebulous thing. So for example, Christopher's talk talked about timing jitter. That's because there's a form of observability that comes from what you can time. One of the things that we're working on right now is ways to take these graphs and put quantifiers onto the edges to say this is an exploit if the timing sequence is um, sufficiently observable. And that has to do with the timing um, analysis uh, granularity against the performance variations. But you could, you could, just as we could imagine an observer model that puts edge weights based on time, you could put edge weights based on power dissipation, on radio emanations, on temperature, right? Um, and say that if someone's in the room and could measure temperature variations right. across the chip, right. then this becomes a side channel that we need to worry about. So there are ways to add quantifiers to some of this that seem promising, um, but I'm not, we're not done with that yet. For sure. Yeah. Hire Caroline and Yatin and see what happens. Okay. <laughs> so in some sense, that's my question is like, is this, is this, work at the level of we need, you know, you need the Carolyn in the room to actually do this or sort of more engineers that can actually use these tools to sort of. Uh, the goal is to have them be engineers. We gave a tutorial at ISCA about a year and a half ago. Our materials are online. The tools, Checkmate isn't open sourced yet, but the TriCheck and PipeCheck and so forth, those tools are all open sourced. The DSL is available. Um, I'll be honest, it's still kind of a pair programming experience probably at its best, right? You know, you sitting alongside someone who knows what's what. Um, but the goal is to have it be something that a hardware designer can use on their own. Yeah. Great. All right, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Okay, our next talk is going to be given by Owner Mutlu, and Owner is a professor of computer science at ETH Zurich, and he's also on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Owner's broad research interests are in computer architecture, systems, and bioinformatics, and uh, a major current focus of his is on memory and storage systems, and he's going to talk today about memory systems. So we're going to be changing a little bit from Meltdown Inspector to uh, Rowhammer and beyond. Um, uh, owner has a history with us at Microsoft Research. In fact, he was the first member of the computer architecture group at Microsoft Research back in 2006. Um, and Owner has won numerous awards, and I'll just mention one here. Uh, he was the winner of the inaugural IEEE Computer, Sci computer Society Young Computer Architect Award. Uh, so take it away, Owner. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you very much, Alec. Is this working? Okay, yeah, it's great uh, to be back here at Microsoft as always, and thanks for the invitation, Stefan and Alec. Uh, I'll talk about Rowhammer. I, I actually see uh, that it's going to be a ch uh, change uh, compared to the previous things, but I actually see these re as related because it's about the mindset that hardware is not is vulnerable, 
and you can actually attack things. And I think there's a history, uh, if we had time, we, that we could go over of these hardware-related attacks. I think Meltdown and Spectre happened because some, some things like Robehammer, for example, instigated some people to actually examine issues in hardware, and they actually found out other issues in hardware. We can talk about that separately. But before, uh, let me see, this is not working. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so before I go into Rollhammer, basically we're going to talk about the main memory system. And it's a critical component of all systems that we design today. Whatever you're designing, you've got to have some working storage. And this system must scale in many dimensions in terms of size, technology, efficiency, cost, algorithms we use to manage it, etc., to maintain the performance growth and the scaling benefits that we've been used to so far. And regardless of whatever you attach to main memory, you're bottlenecked by that interface to main memory. I'll very quickly go over some trends that are affecting main memory to set the stage and how we came to uh, Rowhammer. Basically, these are three major trends that are affecting main memory as I see them. We want more capacity, more bandwidth, more quality of service, more performance. This was, I think, evident in Mark Wisnow's keynote with the beast and the mega beast engines that had terabytes and terabytes of memory, actually. Uh, energy and power is a key system design concern, and technology scaling is ending. This talk is about, uh, going to be about technology scaling. But to understand that, I think we need to cover the other trends also. We are, put, we are able to put a lot of cores on machines, as applications are becoming increasingly data intensive, and we want to consolidate more and more. That's driving the capacity, bandwidth, and quality of service requirements up and up, performance requirements. This is one example. This was actually from a, a paper by HP Labs and University of Michigan. They've shown that core count is increasing much faster than DRM capacity. And that's why we're bottlenecked by DRM capacity. You could argue with all of the numbers on this graph, and you could say that, oh, this trend is not continuing. But if you think about why the trend may not be continuing, we may not be able to feed the cores with the data they need. So we, we, we actually may not be placing cores as, as fast, uh, as much as uh, we were doing in the past. But the trend is actually increasing, uh, similar to this in GPUs. Anyway, uh, we want more capacity from memory, and that drives the capacity of the DRAM chip. And uh, let's take a look at the history of DRAM in the last 18 years in terms of how much capacity, bandwidth, and latency has improved. This has been always a capacity-focused business. And if you look at this, capacity has improved by more than 100x in the last eight, uh, 18 years. And you can see that in the last few years, the trend is not exponential. It's actually staggering a little bit. So we're having difficulties in DRAM scaling. This is an evidence of that. I'll give you more evidence in this talk. Bandwidth has not improved as much, but you could potentially improve it. What, what do you think of latency? How much has it improved in the last 18 years? This much, yeah. I agree, it's this much in this graph. It's basically 30% in commodity DRAM. And if you want to pay for it, you can, accept, of course, give your arm and leg and you can pay for it. But latency is almost constant. But DRAM is critical for performance, capacity, latency, bandwidth. Different applications have different requirements. I think these are backward-looking applications. We have many, many more forward-looking applications that are going to put even more uh, pressure on DRAM. OK, the second major trend, energy, is a key system design concern. And memory consumes a lot of the energy. This is a paper from IBM in 2003 where they showed that in, uh, in their big iron servers, uh, 40 to 50 percent of the entire system energy is spent on the off-chip memory hierarchy. And fast forward to today, there are reports from IBM again in Power 8, uh, more than 40 percent of the power is spent just solely in DRAM. That's true for GPUs also. That other paper from ISCA 2015 is from GPUs, and our results will actually show that also. So memory energy is becoming a big concern, and one of the issues is DRAM consumes power when it's not used. You need to periodically refresh it, and this turns out to be a scaling problem also, which we may get to uh, toward the end of the talk. So on top of all of this, we're requiring a lot more from memory going forward. We're going to require even more with the new applications. But on top of this, we're having difficulties with DRAM technology scaling. Basically, we relied on uh, reducing the size of the DRAM cell to increase the capacity, but this is ending. Basically, ITRS has been uh, projecting for a long time that DRAM will not scale below X nanometers. And I like keeping X over here because I don't need to change my slide, but they change their projections, of course. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the number for X in the next slide. But scaling has enabled us to get more capacity, reasonable energy scaling, lower cost. It didn't help us with latency that much, but it, does, it, it did help with other things. So what is the scaling problem that we're having with DRAM? So any, for any memory to work, you need to have an, a storage device. In DRAM, the storage device is a capacitor. And you need to have an access device. In DRAM, the access device, the access transistor, the bit line, and the sense amplifier. 
Both of these components need to work reliably for any memory to work. In DRAM, this capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing. And this access transistor and the sensing structures must be large enough for low leakage and high, uh, high retention time. And this was the value that was assigned to X by ITRS in 2013. They, they basically said scaling below 35 nanometers is challenging. What, what do you think, uh, uh, what do you guys think where, where we are at uh, memory uh, feature size today? Is it 35 nanometers? This is the dimensions of the cell. 10? Any guesses? 1Z. One 1Z, one that's good, yes. <laughs> We're about maybe 17 nanometers or so. Clearly we've gone below 35 nanometers, but we've, ha we've had issues. So basically, DRAM scaling has become increasingly difficult, and we're going to talk about one of the big problems in DRAM scaling. So what have people done about it? Basically, this has led to the proliferation of different types of DRAM, both the application requirements and the requirements from the bottom. As a result, there are many emerging technologies. You can see that there's 3D stack DRAM, you get higher bandwidth, reduced latency DRAM, low power DRAM, non-volatile memory. They all have greens, but they all have reds also. So there's no single memory that's good at anything. As a result, one major trend has been going into hybrid memory technologies where you have multiple different technologies, potentially multiple different DRAMs, and you design the hardware and the software to manage data allocation and movement such that you achieve the greens as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible. And this requires clearly changes to the interface and changes to become more intelligent in terms of how we manage memory. But this doesn't change the fact that we need to have uh, memory in the system and the memory needs to scale and this is one way of uh, trying to scale memory but it, it turns out you, it's very difficult to get rid of DRAM from the system. People have looked at uh, uh, using MRAM for example or PCM, phase change memory, but it's going to be very difficult to get rid of all of the DRAM from the system. Okay, so let's, talk, let's go a little bit more into detail in the memory scaling problem. There's a lot in the memory problem, memory space, and we're working on a lot. But I'll start with the security part of it, or reliability and safety. I see these as interconnected, and I'm going to make, you, make the connection. But there's a lot more to do in the uh, memory area, as you can see. So why start with security? I like tying this to human lives also. Uh, how many people here know about Abraham Maslow? That's great, yeah. He was a very famous American psychologist. He dedicated his life to understanding why people do things they do. As a result, he, uh, basically this is his uh, major uh, work, uh, that book that he iterated over during his lifetime. And he's probably more famous for this one, essentially, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And he basically said that we need to start with reliability and security, because if you're not reliable and secure, you cannot think about relationships, friends, and you definitely don't care about higher levels of arts if you're about to die at this moment, right? So that's why we need to start with reliability and security. And this is another thing that I use actually in my classes. Probably this should be familiar with people who are living in the Washington state. Yeah, this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge that doesn't exist anymore. This was built in 1940, and six months later, it collapsed this way because of aerostatic flutter. And the new bridges are actually double bridges. Uh, it's not, it, it was actually put, put in there for bandwidth reasons, but it's good for reliability also, having two bridges over there. And I, I, I actually think about asking, uh, I, while I was at Microsoft Research, I interacted uh, with a lot of security people. And this definition of security, I, I like a lot. It's really about uh, preventing unforeseen consequences. And I see uh, the previous talk and the previous two talks, actually, uh, thinking about potentially unforeseen consequences and how can we prevent them. Let me tie back into the DRAM scaling problem. This, this is a, a slide I showed earlier. Basically, we're having difficulties with reducing the size of the circuit. Uh, as we reduce the size of this circuit, both of the reliability properties uh, remain, uh, are, are difficult uh, to maintain. Essentially, this capacitor becomes unreliable, it becomes uh, more vulnerable to noise, and this access transistor becomes more leaky and more vulnerable to noise. As a result, it's really difficult to reduce the size of the circuit. And we've been doing a lot of studies, both at the large scale. I'll give you one example of the large scale study. We've essentially analyzed uh, in this paper from 2015, all of the memory errors that Facebook has recorded over the course of a year in their entire server fleet. This is a lot of servers, actually. And this is a correlational study, as you can see. It turns out as chip density increases, the server failure rate increases. This is because of memory errors, not, not due to other errors. So there's a clear correlation between higher capacity and higher, higher uh, errors. And there's a lot more data in this paper if you're interested, which I'm not going to cover. And when we start, first started studying the DRAM scaling problem, we also wanted to do the small scale studies. And we built this infrastructure, which is essentially an FPGA-based memory controller, where we could do a lot of tests uh, using this memory controller. We could configure anything we wanted, and we keep improving this. 
Uh, and we wanted to study first retention issues, but we, uh, we discovered the Rovhammer problem by building this infrastructure. And actually, this was the infrastructure where we discovered the Rovhammer problem. You could do many, many tests in parallel with different FPGAs. And we open source this infrastructure, so if you're interested, you can uh, download it. It's C++ programmable now. It's much more programmer friendly. And you can do the studies on the FPGAs. We don't provide the FPGAs. You, that you've got to buy. So with this kind of infrastructure, you can actually do a lot of studies on real DRAM chips. We've studied DRAM retention. I'm not going to talk about this. It's really, really interesting. And this is really the fundamental uh, scaling issue with DRAM. As you reduce the size of the circuit, data becomes very difficult to maintain inside a cell. So a charge escapes and charge leaks. How do you figure out how long the charge will stay in that so that you can determine your refresh rate? We'll get back to that if we have time. But while we were actually uh, doing studies in this infrastructure, we were inspired by other studies that we were doing in flash memory. And flash memory is very much prone to read disturb errors. And we said, oh, maybe there are read disturb errors in DRAM also. Let's test it using this infrastructure. And what we found was actually curious at that time. We said, oh, we basically found that you can predictably induce uh, memory errors, bit flips, in most DRAM memory chips at the time. This is called the DRAM Rowhammer problem. It's essentially a simple har hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vu vulnerability. And you can do it in a programmatic way. And people uh, wrote things like this. This is one of the examples. I like this. Uh, I put it over here because I like the title. It says, forget software. Now hackers are exploiting physics. And this actually, I think, uh, explains the problem in a nice way. So what is the problem? If you look at uh, DRAM, it consists of a bunch of rows. And if you want to read data from a row, you need to activate that row, which means that you need to apply high voltage to that word line. And if you want to read some other row, you need to deactivate that row, or this is called a precharge in DRAM, apply low voltage. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, before the cells get refreshed, and if you do it enough times, it turns out in most modern DRAM chips, adjacent rows get bit flips, some bits flip from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1, depending on the encoding. Now, this is not supposed to happen clearly, because you're not even writing to memory. You're, not, you're reading from memory, and you're affecting the cells that are around you. Those cells could be belonging to some other application, to the operating system. Essentially, this is a reliability problem, but this could also be a security vulnerability. So we call this the hammer row. We call these the victim rows. And it turns out that most real DRAM chips that you can buy in the market, more than 80% of them, at the time you've done these tests, were vulnerable. We could predictably induce these errors. Uh, and this is actually a scaling problem because this didn't happen before 2010. The first instance that we saw was in 2010. And all of the chips that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 that we tested were actually vulnerable. Why is the scaling problem? Essentially, cells got too close to each other. They're not elect in enough isolated electrically from each other. And one, uh, I'll talk about the causes very briefly later on, but one intuitive cause is essentially electromagnetic coupling. Because one word line is too close to the other word line, whenever you toggle this word line, apply high voltage, the other word line is not electrically isolated enough. You're toggling it a little bit. As a result, you're opening that word line, which means that the cells that are vulnerable to this effect are leaking a little bit. And if you do it enough times, they leak a little bit enough times. And if you do it enough times before the cells get refreshed, you basically depleted the charge on some of the cells over there. If the cells weren't too close to each other, meaning back in 2008, you didn't have this problem. And this is a very fundamental problem in any kind of memory, actually. At any kind of memory, when it scales, you get this sort of read disturbance issues. If you have time, we'll talk about flash memory, but we won't have time for that. So what's more interesting about this being in DRAM is DRAM is directly exposed to the programming language. This is one example programming language, assembly language. So we wrote this code which is essentially executed at the user level, what it does is it basically avoids cache hits for these two uh, addresses, avoids row hits for those two addresses, and it basically ping-pongs activates to X and Y to the same bank. And if the chip is vulnerable, it'll essentially uh, get these errors. And you can download this code and run it on your laptop. Actually, you, you, can, you can download Google's code, which, which improved our code, and uh, they, uh, you could, you're more likely to discover bit flips. And at the time we did these studies, this was around 2012, uh, basically we, we ran it on real systems. And you can see that as long as you have a memory controller that's good at activating fast, that's fa uh, that is able to access memory fast, you're able to induce these errors. And there's nothing special about Intel and AMD. All of the memory controllers that are out in the market are capable of doing that uh, in, in real processors today. So it's a real reliability and security issue. 
In fact, it's, uh, we thought it was more of a security issue than a reliability issue. When we wrote the paper, uh, the first sentence we, uh, we used was, memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system, and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. I still believe this. I think this is very fundamental. We should keep this invariant. And we also said that you could actually design an attack that could take over an entire system by exploiting the bit, bit flips. And the good folks at Google Project Zero did exactly that. Uh, they published this beautiful blog post, it's beautiful system security engineering, where they said they exploited the DRAM rope hammer bug. I don't like the term bug, I think a failure mechanism is a nicer one over here, uh, to, to gain kernel privileges. And this is directly copied and pasted from their blog post uh, from 2015. They basically test a selection of laptops and uh, copied a, uh, found a subset of them exhibit the problem, and they, they built two working privilege exploitation exploits. One of them is less interesting to me. It attacks the Google native client. The other one essentially is able to uh, run a user level process and it's able to induce these bit flips. And they were able to induce bit flips in the page table entries of that user level process that point to their own page table. And if you're able to actually do that, now you can change the contents of your own page table. For example, you can, you can gain write enable access to your own page table. And once you have that access, you have, entire, uh, you have full access to the entire memory. That's essentially what they did. And they were able to do this successfully on, I believe, 50% of the machines that they have tested uh, laptops. And this became even more interesting at that time. This is called Rowhammer vulnerability, and people start, start drawing pictures like this. I like analogies, and I, this is a beautiful analogy that someone had on Twitter. It's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming uh, neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door that you were really after. So if you want to escape from here, you might want to start banging on these walls over here. Okay, and uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot of attacks that were developed on top of this. I'm not going to go over this. This is basically, uh, these slides are available. You can go over these. People have developed a lot of attacks over the years, uh, even very recently. I'm going to highlight a couple of them. This is one of the attacks from TU Graz. This is actually the same folks who developed uh, Meltdown and Spectre later on. Uh, they basically showed that you could remotely gain access to the system of a website visitor by exploiting, by inducing Rowhammer induced bit flips through JavaScript. Very interesting. This is another one. This basically showed that you could do this on an Android system in an ARM processor. And what they did was they were able to, uh, because they knew how the operating system actually allocated pages, they were able to uh, figure out which pages are vulnerable to Rowhammer uh, through a profiling process. And they were able to um, fool the operating system into allocating uh, a page table uh, into uh, a page that they knew was vulnerable to Rowhammer, and they would hammer that, and they would gain access deterministically uh, to many, many cell phones this way. That's another beautiful paper, actually. And you can download their app, I think. I don't know if this is still functional, if you would like to <laughs> be hacked. And this, these are actually more recent. This is uh, May 2018. Uh, the, same, uh, the same folks at uh, Amsterdam, uh, they basically showed that you could do this through the GPU in an integrated, again, uh, in a mobile system. And a GPU is much more, uh, because it can access memory much faster, you can actually induce these bit flips uh, much better. And you could actually do it over the network also uh, through the RDMA, by exploiting RDMA. And I believe there's more to come. Uh, maybe one solution to Rowhammer is this. This is another attack that, <laughs> that could uh, drive people crazy. I don't think this is a good solution. Let me very quickly go over understanding Rowhammer, and then we'll talk about solutions, and then maybe some future vulnerabilities. So as I said, there are a bunch of causes. This is actually a complex problem. As circuits become smaller, you have many failure mechanisms that affect this uh, that in combination lead to Rowhammer. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but manufacturers are very well aware of it, and we're in touch with them. And if you have this sort of infrastructure, you can do many, many studies. And I'm going to talk about a couple of these. Uh, basically, uh, what is the difference between the address of a row that you're hammering and the victim rows? We did this study. And it, it turns out most of them are adjacent rows, as expected. But some of them are not adjacent because there's some internal remapping that DRAM, uh, address remapping that DRAM does internally. So if you want to hammer really perfectly, you may want to know this address mapping, or if you want to protect. The access interval today, you can access memory every 55 nanoseconds. That's the TRC, row cycling delay, that's a single bank. If you actually prohibit this, you can get rid of the errors. Clearly, this is one solution. You can throttle the accesses to memory by reducing the access rate. Uh, so this is clear. Uh, you can do that. This is not a good solution, I believe, because this reduces your performance, clearly. Refresh interval is another parameter that you can play with. Clearly, if you refresh DRAM more often, the probability of attack reduces. Uh, this is, you reduce the refreshes by 7x, 
it gets rid of every single error that we see in the DRAM. But 7x, increasing the refresh, refreshes by 7x is probably not a good solution, even though it solves the problem. This is very interesting because uh, the attack is actually much more possible if your data pattern is uh, conducive to the attack. So if your data pattern is solid like this, you don't get a lot of errors. But if your data pattern is this way, which induces much more coupling between the different cells that are adjacent to each other, you get many, many more errors. OK, so there are a bunch of other results. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, the red ones are the important ones for security. Errors are repeatable. If you can actually uh, flip a bit, you're going to flip it again and again and again and again. And you can actually get many errors per cache line, which means that simple error correcting codes are not able to get rid of all of the errors. You need more sophisticated error correcting codes. And cells are actually affected by two aggressor rows on either side. This is actually what Google exploited to make the attack much more uh, powerful. They basically did this double-sided row hammering and they hammered a single row by sandwiching it between two, two things that are hammered. There's a lot more in row hammer analysis in this paper and a recent paper that I've written. I'd be happy to talk about that separately also. But let's talk about solutions a little bit. These are more traditional solutions, I think, uh, which all have downsides. Uh, clearly, you can make better DRAM chips, but that's going to be difficult to do. You can refresh frequently. We'll get back to that. You can have sophisticated DCC. And you can have access counters to throttle. But all of these actually come with downsides, I believe. So we want to have simple solutions to the problem. Uh, and our paper actually uh, looks, looks at all of these different solutions. L let me tell you about what is employed in existing systems. Because in existing systems, you have to employ something to be able to patch it. And this is Apple's patch for Rowhammer. Uh, basically, they said that they mitigated the Rowhammer issue by increasing the memory refresh rates. And this is, I think, employed by industry. This, this is the configurability that we have in our memory controllers today. We can do it, and as a result, we do it. And I believe this is a reasonable solution. This is much simpler than the software-based solutions that could potentially detect the attacks. Of course, the downside is we actually don't want to increase the refresh rates. In real systems, we want to get rid of refresh as much as possible. If you increase the refresh rates, you're increasing the performance impact and also power impact. So our solution was a more probabilistic. We called it the probabilistic adjacent row activation. The idea is after you close a row, you activate one of the neighbors or both of the neighbors with very low probability. And this gives you a reliability guarantee that's better than the reliability guarantee that you have for hard disks for today. So this is pretty strong. Depending, depends on, of course, how you set your P probability over here. But the big advantage of this is you don't refresh the entire memory. You refresh only. Uh, in a targeted way and very, very infrequently. As a result, the overheads are very low and it's also stateless. You don't need to keep track of any state to be able to do that because you know which row you're closing before you refresh it probabilistically. So there are multiple ways of actually implementing it. The first one is actually employed in uh, DRAM chips going forward. I'm not sure if this is a really, really good idea inside the DRAM chip going forward fully because the way it's employed in existing DRAM chips without changing the interface is by exploiting the slack and timing parameters. Whenever you close a row, there's enough slack in the timing parameters that the DRAM manufacturers can sneak in a refresh to the adjacent rows or one of the adjacent rows. So we've actually shown that there's plenty of slack today that you can exploit to be able to do this reliably. But going forward, we actually want to remove that slack also so that we can make DRAM lower latency. So I don't believe this is a really good solution without changing the interface. The second solution is doing it in the memory controller, having a more intelligent memory controller uh, that basically knows which rows are physically adjacent to each other. This information is not known to the memory controller today because DRAM actually does remapping of rows internally for various reasons. Uh, but if this information is communicated to the memory controller, I believe there could be much better solutions. So we need a better DRAM interface and more intelligent memory controllers to solve these problems in a, in a nice way, I think. So this was actually, actually uh, something that I recently uh, saw. Uh, apparently, this is one of the ThinkPads. Um, uh, in, in the BIOS, you can have different row hammer solutions. You could either double your refresh rate or have this hardware row hammer protection, which is kind of mysterious. But clearly, they're doing some probabilistic uh, solution, so you can actually change the Rohammer activation probability in some way uh, to be uh, to to, and you can decide your protection level if you, if you will over here. It was fun to see this. <laughs> okay, uh, so industry is actually writing papers about it too. Uh, this is not related to the Rohammer, but this talks about the DRAM scaling challenges in general, and it focuses on what I said is real is the real scaling challenge, the refresh problem, I, uh, and the variable retention time problem, which we will cover if we have time still. But the, uh, the key point that I want to make is, other than recommending this paper that was written by two 
unlikely partners that will ever write a paper together, Samsung and Intel. Uh, they also say a good solution for them is actually co-architecting DRAM and controllers together and having an intelligent controller. This paper actually proposed error correcting codes to be inside the DRAM. If you went to the DRAM manufacturers 10 years ago and said, I want error correcting codes in your chip, you would be kicked out of the door as soon as possible probably because they don't want to in, uh, reduce their capacity. But now actually DRAM chips going forward will have error correcting codes. But as, as I said, error correcting codes are good at solving random issues. They're, they're actually a costly solution. You can, you, we want to really target the solutions uh, to the problems at hand. So I think Rohammer can be sold in a much easier way than error correcting codes. The reason they're putting error correcting codes is because of retention. Because they do not, uh, they're not able to determine the retention times really easily. Uh, and as a result, error correcting codes can uh, correct some of those errors that are happening because of retention issues. Okay, so, uh, so in, I said intelligent memory controls is one solution and we know actually how to build this. We've actually been building this for, for flash memory for a long time. I believe DRAM is going to look increasingly more like flash memory as it scales down. And flash memory, if you look at the flash memory controllers, this is a paper that we recently written uh, based on about eight years of research that we've done in the field. Uh, you, there's a lot of uh, error correction mechanisms that goes into the memory controller. Memory controller really understands the different types of errors and actually targets the error correction mechanisms to the different types of errors, specializes uh, its mechanisms. And I'd be happy to talk about that in more detail, certainly. So basically, key takeaway, I think, to solve these issues going forward is we want intelligent memory controllers. And clearly, we have a challenge and opportunity going forward. How do we design fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe computing architectures? Okay. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, we have the room until noon. Until noon. So we stop to you as to how much time we have. Okay. Any any questions so far? You you said you wanted this to be interactive, so I can take some questions and then uh, maybe I can continue. told us about some hardware mitigations for, for these kinds of problems. Is it conceivable that there would be some simple conservative characterization of software that would, would prove that even the, the, the old style of hardware would avoid road hammer problems? Maybe your compiler would then make an effort to meet these conditions about software? Um, so you're thinking of basically somehow analyzing the software and uh, saying you're not. Uh, I think it's certainly possible you could potentially analyze these cases. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really worth the effort because okay. usually uh, this is, uh, you're, you're probably thinking of this being a reliability problem in a real production environment, right? Not as a security problem. But both. For a security problem, I guess you could, you, then you have to analyze all of the code that runs on your system, right? You need to be in a protected environment and you disallow code or maybe you change the code dynamically if it does row hammer. I think it's certainly possible, yes. I believe it's a higher overhead solution because I think hardware, this is really a solution that can be, uh, the problem that can be fixed relatively easily in hardware. That's my belief. <laughs> okay. But people have actually proposed uh, performance counter based mechanisms, not necessarily uh, static or program analysis mechanisms that try to figure out whether a, a program is row hammering, but people have looked at uh, performance counters and tried to figure out, oh, is this uh, code doing uh, hammering? Mm. But there's performance overhead clearly associated with those. Thanks. Sure. Yes. Great talk, owner. I have always wondered how, what was the hypothesis that led you guys to discover Roe Hammer, right? So, and maybe there are lessons there to discover more vulnerabilities yeah, in yeah. brain memory. No, no, that's great. I, that's a great question, I think. Well, uh, basically, <laughs> I'll say the hypothesis was this infrastructure that we built for flash memory. So we built this infrastructure for flash memory and earlier than we did for uh, uh, DRAM, and we knew that there are a lot of errors. Clear read disturb errors are actually a, a clear problem with flash memory, and controllers actually take into account those. And we wanted to say uh, we knew that read disturb errors are actually a problem in other memory technologies, also SRAM, for example. And we want to test though so it could potentially happen in DRAM if it scales down. Right. So I think this is the value of the infrastructure. I, I must say, <laughs> if you didn't have this flash memory infrastructure, maybe we wouldn't be building the DRAM infrastructure also. Okay, one more. So, uh, uh, what do you think about Intel's uh, hardware mitigation called TRR, target low refresh, target refresh low, whatever? Yeah, I think we can have a longer conversation related to that. I believe, I believe a probabilistic solution is much simpler. Okay. 
just to clarify, in your opinion, sorry, yeah. just to clarify, in your opinion, the research community has proposed simpler and more effective solution than what the what the hardware, whether Intel or the DRAM vendors have decided to adopt. Adopt. So, no, not, not exactly. I think targeted row refresh changes the interface a little bit uh, without exposing the DRAM internal. So I think, I believe if you can, if you get rid of the, inter, uh, change the interface a little bit differently, exposing the DRAM internals, you can have a much better solution. So it does a different trade-off. Basically, they don't want to, they don't want to expose the DRAM internals to the memory control. I believe that's why they went to the targeted row refresh solution. But I think if we relax the interface a little bit, which we have many, many other reasons for doing so. For example, if you want to enable in-memory computation, if you want to enable lower latency, it's good to get rid of some of the, uh, change the interface a little bit. Then I think you can go into uh, other solutions. The other answer to your question, DRAM manufacturers are actually internally adopting something similar to what we have proposed, uh, except they're doing it, again, within the boundaries of the current interface. As a result, I'm not sure if the solution is uh, going to be very long-lasting. I also wanted to add that there is one research publication out there that claims that they mounted raw hammer attack on a DIM that implements TRR according to the spec. They could not, you don't know whether the DIM does TRR or not, because you're, unless you work for the, DIM, the memory manufacturer, but according to the spec, they implement TRR and they were able to mount raw hammer still. No. <laughs> uh, just one, one brief follow up on that. Sure. I was wondering if you have any, uh, a any comment on the, the resilience of attack, uh, uh, resilience against attack of PTRR versus TRR, pseudo trusted rare refresh versus trusted rare refresh. Okay, what's the exact difference? Um, Five it, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, Intel has both specified, marketed uh, bo both as, as uh, specifications that. Uh, uh, manufacturers can, compl can comply with, but not all of those details are open. Exactly. So yeah. I think I think that's that's part of the problem. If if the details are not open, it's very hard to reason about the uh, efficacy of the solutions. I just want to know what you've heard. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> um, so you you briefly mentioned uh, SRAM. Have, have there have you have there been any observations of mm -hmm. uh, of Rohammer like vulnerabilities in SRAM? Um, not, as far as I know, not in real systems, but a lot of people have shown that uh, when they build uh, circuits that are uh, with very small feature sizes, SRAM also is vulnerable to read disturb errors. But there are protection mechanisms, I believe, in existing SRAMs uh, in the processors. Because they're easy to do, right? You don't need to change any interfaces for those protection mechanisms. Uh, so you mentioned about bringing down the refresh time. So, but for that, don't you think you need to know the retention times of each rows, which may be widely variable across rows? Uh, you mean as a solution to yeah. Rohamer? Mm -hmm. So they're in, they're basically increasing the uh, refresh frequency. Right, but so uh, perf uh, basically you're in in you're refreshing more often. That's not a problem. No, but how often? Because the the different rows will have variable retention times, right? Due to manufacturing variability. That's true, but the, but the goal is uh, their goal is to basically refresh more frequently, such that you cannot do in, uh, as many activates with a refresh interval. Okay. So I it see. doesn't matter what the retention time of the row is, as long as you're refreshing more frequently, you don't have any correctness issues in terms of retention time loss, but you do prevent uh, uh, row hammer. Uh, attacks. Okay. But, but your question, I think, how, uh, how much should you increase your refresh mm -hmm. interval? According to our results, if your only solution is refresh, if you want to get rid of every single error that we've seen in our, uh, in our DIMMs, you want to increase refresh rate by 7x. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they're not doing 7x. Mm -hmm. They're doing 2x, in my opinion. The, the picture I, that, I sh that I showed you from the ThinkPad BIOS was 2x. That was your only option. Is 2x enough to get rid of all of the errors? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, sorry, got to ask this question. Otherwise, I couldn't couldn't follow what you were you were talking about. So a while back, when I'm still in the the memory area, my understanding is that row hammer is caused by um, uh, um, uh, broken state in the cell, the band gap, and then mm -hmm. when you if that's due to the metal layer, mm -hmm. if you use polycyclic gate, the problem would have been would have gone away. Mm -hmm. Right. So, are you are you saying that today, even today, like Samsung is still using uh, metal gate? That's why you still have this problem. 
Is that, is that a case? So I cannot speak for Samsung, but yeah, I think the causes that I mentioned, I think yeah. you, the cause that you mentioned is still certainly valid. Okay. Uh, but the uh, but the cause that I mentioned, it's really a combination of those reasons. Okay, so there are multiple reasons that, uh, as far as we know. So your experiment was done on later than even the latest memory, the DRAM. You still see the problem. So uh, the the experiments that I reported are from 2014 when we discovered uh, actually 2012 okay. to 2014 okay. when we discovered the problem. The okay. paper was published in 2014. Uh, latest DRAM, we're looking into it. Uh, there are reports that latest DRAM also has these errors that Stefan mentioned. Okay. But I'm uh, I I didn't do those we didn't do those studies ourselves. I agree with you. If you if you can solve the problem with uh, changing the gate, that would be ideal. I'm not sure if it's going to be very easy. <laughs> yeah, ECC. Yeah, yeah, I agree. ECC is not a good solution to this problem. But probabilistic. I think the probabilistic solution is uh, maybe cheaper than the gate solution, depending on the constraints, right? Okay, so let me <laughs> use the last few minutes uh, to conclude, I think. I think we had a good discussion. I'm not going to go over these future challenges, unfortunately. Uh, I think there are a bunch, uh, but you can take a look at the slides. Clearly, refresh is going to be a challenge, and th these slides actually have a lot of detail on refresh, if you're interested in that. I believe, actually, there are retention time uh, issues uh, that may be slipping into the field, but they may be a little bit harder to exploit uh, than, uh, uh, than Rowhammer at the moment, at least. Okay, so how do we keep memory secure? I think there, clearly we have uh, ten, DRAM issues with DRAM. We have issues with flash memory, although flash memory is a little bit far uh, from uh, the system today. But emerging memory technologies actually all have their reliability problems. Read disturb, write disturb, many, many different reliability problems. Uh, I think we need some principled approaches. We need to somehow predict and prevent such safety issues. And I go back to the Galloping Gurdy, which is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Uh, and people have developed uh, principal designs for this. Uh, this is actually taught in civil engineering and physics classes, uh, this particular bridge, if you will. So how do we do it for memory? Uh, this is my proposal. Uh, I think we want to first understand. It's very difficult to really model these effects. If you want to go to, we've done a lot of circuit simulations. It's very, very difficult to model something like Rowhammer. Uh, in, in, in circuits. You really need to somehow predict uh, based on other technologies, based on past experience. So we want solved methodologies for failure modeling and discovery. And I believe this has to come from real devices, both at the small scale and large scale. We want to build models that can predict the future. We want to build models that can predict from different po devices potentially. How do we do that? I think this is an open research question. And we do want to develop metrics for secure architectures. I, and I, I say secure over here, but I think Rohammer demonstrated that reliability, safety, and security are really uh, very much related to each other uh, in, in this particular context. On top of this, I believe we need to architect. We need to have principled co-architecting of the system and memory. We need to have good partitioning of duties across the stack. So I believe ECC is not a good solution because it's not a good partitioning of the duties for, a, for the given problem of Rohammer. So for each problem, we need to find the good partitioning. And I believe flash memory is a very good example where people actually find the right partitioning. Uh, so they solve some of the problems with ECC, but they solve a lot of the problems with voltage scaling as well. And I believe a good architecting requires uh, figuring out these uh, or, or uh, potentially preventing these unforeseen consequences. So how do you prevent for, uh, unforeseen consequences? I believe if we had better programmability in our memory controller, we wouldn't be refreshing uh, our entire memory by 2x or 4x. So if we had a better programmability or better patchability in the field, we would be doing better today. And I think this design needs to change. Basically today, uh, we don't have, we're not really thinking about security in our designs. In the hardware design, we don't really design with security. I believe we need to design, uh, to change that also. And uh, I didn't talk about it, but one of the ways of uh, having a design that can, uh, over time, uh, fix some of these reliability issues is having a design that can do online testing, which is essentially what flash, flash memory is doing today. If we have a mechanism to do online testing in a low overhead manner in DRAM, I think that would go a long way, because that, that can enable also patchability potentially. Uh, so that's what we've been doing to understand. We've built these infrastructures, both for flash memory and DRAM, and we've been doing large scale and small scale studies. I believe there are actually vulnerabilities in flash memory also. We've been exploring some of these that are similar. Uh, read disturb is one example over there, but this is much, much more, much, much harder to exploit because flash memory is much farther. It's not directly exposed to the programming model basically today. But there's a lot to do over there. Okay, I'm not gonna cover this. Uh, 
I think there are two other solution directions that I will briefly talk about. One is new technology. You can say, oh, why don't we get rid of DRAM and come up with some other technology that doesn't have these problems? Good luck. <laughs> I think it's definitely good to exploit, uh, explore these technologies, but all of these technologies, as they scale to small size, they will have reliability problems. And they actually, some of them have endurance problems also. And maybe the second solution is even more interesting. You can embrace unreliability, uh, but if you, you've got to do it very carefully. Basically, you can design memories with different reliability and store data intelligently across them. Your secure uh, data may be in a very, very reliable memory that's much more expensive. And your unsecure uh, data that doesn't require a lot of security or reliability may be in the masses of memory that's not so reliable but very low cost. As long as you, that, you do that partitioning right, I think this is a really good opportunity. But how do you do that partitioning right is a difficult question. And I believe both of these solutions over here require co-design across the hierarchy. So it may not be that easy to adopt uh, all, uh, both of these solutions. But I think there's a lot uh, more to do in this heterogeneous reliability memory area. That may be a good solution. So let me conclude. Uh, I believe memory reliability is reducing. There's a lot of data that is in the field and that I've shown you. Uh, reliability issues open up security vulnerabilities as well. And these are very hard to defend against. Uh, or you come up with very suboptimal solutions like increasing the refresh rates across the board. Rowhammer is an example. I believe there will be more examples. And I believe uh, the uh, uh, Rowhammer's implications of system security re research are tremendous and exciting. And there's, there continues to be a lot of papers that are being written on Rowhammer these days. So there's good news. We have a lot more to do, clearly. And I believe we need to come up with principled methodologies and designs to be able to solve problems like this, like Rowhammer, and whatever comes next after Rowhammer. I think this is one principle that we, <laughs> we will need to adopt uh, going forward somehow. We need to change the processor memory interface somehow uh, and have more intelligence uh, in the memory controller. Okay, thank you. <laughs>